Our next session will be cybersecurity, presented by Ms. Vicki Machetti, who is from the Department of Defense CIO office, and Ms. Mary Thomas of the DPAP office. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki Machetti. I work for the DOD CIO. And I'm here with Mary Thomas, who's from the Defense Procurement um, Office. And we're here to talk to you about how DOD is protecting our unclassified cyber, um, our unclassified information. Um, so this is what we're gonna cover today. We are gonna talk a little bit about cybersecurity and why it's important. Then we'll talk about what DOD is actually doing and we'll get into the details of a, um, a DFARS clause that has, was put together uh, back in 2013 and updated recently, and it's gotten a lot of attention by our defense contractors. And we'll summarize it with a little bit of resources for people to be able to go to, and then we'll take any questions. Okay, so I think that not a day goes by when there's not some sort of cyber event being reported in the news. You see it everywhere, you hear it, whether it's personal or if it's businesses, you've got Target, you've got Sony, you have OPM. There's plenty of examples out there of where uh, cyber threats have been targeting industry and stealing personal information, proprietary information, developmental information, anything that they can get and exploit. Cybersecurity incidents are on the rise. It's an easy, cheap way to steal somebody else's intellectual property. So. Uh, it, it's very costly. It costs companies over $400 billion a year to clean up and, and recover from that. And some companies don't recover. And certainly some CIOs out there don't recover either. Um, we'd see an increase in cyber crime. If you think about all the hospitals have had ransomware issues and things like that. And the reality is, is that most of the time it's a, a financial or an espionage motive. So why do we care about that? Well, the defense industrial base makes all of our capabilities. Defense Department doesn't build ships, we don't build planes, we don't build weapons, but we contract for that. And so it's very important to us to ensure that the information, that proprietary or developmental information is protected when it's in the hands of our industry partners. Um, in the end, what we know is the adversary is, finds this to be very lucrative, that they can come and steal a significant amount of data and then use it to either clone our capabilities, get ahead of us in the leap ahead technologies, or counter us, and we don't want to find out about that when we're out on the battle space and our warfighters' lives are, in, are at risk. So it's very important to the department that we are taking steps to protect that data any way we, that we can. Now, because we do rely on the defense industrial base to build all these capabilities, we're pushing data out to them that needs to be protected, and it, it is living in hosted, it is either transiting, it's somewhere resident in their privately owned networks. So DOD has a limited amount of ability to affect how that data is protected. One such way that we have done that is with the DFAR clause that we're going to start to talk about. So how we are looking at this is a range of activities that include both regulatory and voluntary programs. Um, we are trying to secure DOD's information systems every day as well as making sure that our contractor base is also securing their information systems to protect our information. We have some voluntary threat programs, and we're also leveraging federal standards so that there's consistency as a contractor works for many different government agencies as well as across the department. So some of you I know are not DOD in the room, and you may be thinking, why do I care? Um, well, one of the reasons you might want to be thinking about this is when we talk about NIST 800-171, NARA is intending to use 800-171 as the standard to protect all controlled unclassified information as they implement it for the federal government. And what it's going to end up looking at is a FAR clause that would be pushed out to all federal contractors that would hold them accountable to being compliant with the security standards in this publication. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that publication today. So over to you. So um, what we like to do when we start talking about what kinds of requirements are in place to protect our information is to start at ground zero and just kind of lay out the whole spectrum of possibilities. We realize that there are many stakeholders in this space and not everybody are cyber security experts. So we deal often with contracting people, we deal with folks from across all parts of industry, 
Um, so we do deal with some security experts, PMs and PEOs, um, and everybody comes from it from a different perspective. And we have found that it's important to just highlight the fact that how we protect information on a government information system or network is very different than how we protect information or, or ask contractors to protect information on their internal contractor information systems. Um, so this chart just sets the stage for that. Um, we're gonna focus mostly on the gray area today um, and something called covered defense information, which is the information that the department wants to protected on contractors' unclassified information systems. Um, the DFARS rule that um, Vicki mentioned earlier is called Network Penetration Reporting and Contracting for Cloud Services. There's five different pieces to this rule. There's two provisions, three clauses, um, but what we're going to focus on largely today is the DFARS Clause 252-204-7012. Um, it is something that goes into all solicitations and contracts except for commercial off-the-shelf items. Um, and it requires contractors to protect their covered defense information, which we'll give you a good definition for today as well. Um, we're happy to address questions that you might have through the other aspects of this rule as well, and we'll touch on cloud a little bit um, just to see if there's any questions out there. Um, for the clause that we're talking about, safeguarding covered defense information, um, it actually was first published in November of 2013. So it's been around for a while. When we first published it, it was focused on unclassified controlled technical information. Um, as we published iterations of that role, we broadened the scope of what was covered because we found people needed more than just the uncontrol unclassified controlled technical information protected, and we wanted to ensure that the same protections were required for all of the information. We wanted to give um, industry a single solution to protecting all of the information so that we didn't have government organizations across DOD asking for them to do different things on their single um, information system. So we broadened it to capture more information, which we'll show you a little bit about next. We also, over time, changed what protections they needed to put in place. In November of 2013, the only protections we had to select from was from NIST Special Pub 853. And if anybody is familiar with that, that's actually um, a document that is focused on protecting government systems. It's very federalistic, and it gives lots of how-to, very prescriptive in terms of how to protect your information system. Not always um, something that makes sense for industry who is dealing with an existing information system which holds way more than just our weapon system information. They're doing a lot more with their systems. So the folks at NIST put together something called Special Pub 800-171, protecting controlled unclassified information on non-federal systems. Um, it is much more performance based, if you will. Um, and it allows flexibility in how um, a contractor or subcontractor will apply those requirements. How they decide to meet the requirement that's in 171 is going to be based on what kind of systems they have, where they are, how many customers, how many employees, and so forth. Um, so it's much more flexible and um, much more realistic for us to ask industry to implement. Other changes that we made as we moved forward with the rule, um, we gave them extra time to implement the standards. So right now, industry has until December 31st, 2017 um, to get these requirements in place on their information systems. And Vicki's going to talk to you a little bit about how we're managing that process. Um, I mentioned that we would talk to you about covered defense information. Um, this gets tons of questions wherever we go. Um, and this last final version of the clause actually clarified it a bit. So there's several things to know about 
um, covered defense information. First of all, it's not some type, special type of information. It's just a term that we use to identify the information that needs to be protected in our DOD contracts. Um, so it's not like you're gonna look it up and find it as a category that has special requirements. We're just using it to capture what we want protected. Um, we also have identified the fact that in order for it to need to be protected, you would probably find it in the CUI registry. That's because the CUI registry, by definition, can only contain things that require safeguarding and dissemination controls. So um, CDI, controlled tech defense information isn't the same as CUI. We just use that registry to say, this is the universe of information that might become CDI. It's something that the government might want to protect. Um, second, the government, um, the Department of Defense in this case, needs to identify in the contract the fact that there is information in this contract that needs to be protected. So you might often hear industry complain that they now have the requirement to decide what information needs to be protected. And that's why we made this very clear in the final rule that the responsibility is on the program office, on the requiring activity, to identify what information needs to be protected. And we tell our contracting officers that it's their responsibility to make sure that the program office is giving them that information. Um, finally, if it's information that's not being provided to industry, we still need to protect the information that industry might develop as part of the effort. Um, and so that also would be identified in the contract that this contract, this effort is going to require you to deal with information that will have to be categorized as covered defense information. Okay, so when they have identified what this information would be, then the contractor is required to provide adequate security for that information. And we've defined adequate security as at a minimum to have the network or information system on which that information resides be compliant with the safeguards that are in NIST 800-171. So this would be their own privately owned systems. This is not a system operated on behalf of the department. It would be a system that they own and it perhaps they use, more than likely use for all of their practices, whether they're um, contracting for DOD or commercial or otherwise. Now there may be situations where the requiring activity or the program office feels that that baseline security is not sufficient and they could then, in fact, add additional security requirements on top of those requirements in 800-171. But they would need to identify that in the contract, and that would be in addition to the language that's in the clause already today. Um, so we're going to go on to this part. So a little bit more about 800-171. As Mary said, it was developed specifically for contractors to use on their, their already established information systems. It doesn't have such specificity that we had in 800-153. It's very broad. It allows a contractor to be able to figure out if they're actually doing an activity or has some kind of um, capability to secure their systems and meet those requirements without it being prescriptive. As Mary said, there were performance-based um, requirements, and they're more easily applied to their existing systems. And finally, it allows us a standardized process across the federal government. And as I said in the beginning, we do expect that NARA is going to be issuing a federal rule sometime, maybe after the rule freezes are up, um, and we'll be able to move forward in the regulatory process because their intent was to do it this calendar year. I don't know that that's necessarily going to happen, but they're definitely going to work towards that. But the intent is to, uh, to use this same standard, um, the 800-171, for all federal contracts. So a little bit more about how a business would approach this. Um, we understand there's a lot of concern in the small business that this is really hard to do and we're not gonna be able to do it and we're not gonna be able to do business with DOD. And so we wanna start, e tell each small business company to look at the requirements, sit down and read through the publication. There are 110 security requirements in the state 100-171. It is, it is not as overwhelming as they think it is, and if they sit down and read through it, they're gonna be able to go in and say, I do this, I think I do this, and I'm gonna have to check on this one, and maybe I know I don't do this. 
and they can start to build their plan so that they can become compliant in a reasonable and responsible amount of time. So one of the things to understand is not every one of the requirements requires a material solution. A lot of them are policy or process requirements, making sure that they have a way to check and know that certain things are happening on their systems. Um, and in particularly for small business, a lot of times it doesn't make a lot of sense. If I tell you you need to have an inventory of all of your IT assets, if you're a very large company like Lockheed Martin with hundreds of thousands of, of IT systems, they're gonna probably wanna go with an automated inventory system and capability. If you're a very small company with say 10 people and a few laptops and a couple of, of uh, iPhones, you can probably do that manually and just take a check and go through and make sure that you know where all of your assets are. So there's a lot of different ways to approach this and that's one of the things we wanna encourage small business to sit down and read through the, the requirements determine what's readily accomplished now and what needs to be an IT solution, and then develop their plan of action and milestones so that they can, they can satisfy those requirements. Our next slide is a uh, chart that shows how we've binned all these requirements. The requirements are aligned like 800-53 with uh, the categories, uh, <laughs> and if you see 3.11, 3.12, and so on and so forth, there's 110 altogether. The key point is, is the yellow ones are policy and process ones. The blue ones we think are more of configuration. How are you setting up your IT network? And then you have some things that are more software or hardware solutions. If you kind of look at it this way, it's not a I'll go out and purchase a capability. It's not intended to do that. It's intended to look at your network and your systems, see what you have in place, and then figure out what you need to do to move forward. So we've been out on the road often, um, different audiences, different groups of stakeholders, and we get many questions. So as a result, we have um, over 50 frequently asked questions published at the DPAP website, um, but there are some that we pulled out because we feel like almost every single audience asks about them. Um, when dealing with industry, they always ask, you know, who's going to come and monitor our systems to see if we're actually implementing 171. Um, and so that is not going to happen. Um, the department, when, pa when publishing this DFARS rule, realized that there is no conceivable way for us to um, deal with the volume of contractors and subcontractors that we have to deal with to be able to go out and do a hands-on inspection of their systems. Um, so that is not the intent. Um, People also ask if they should get a third-party assessor to assess their systems, um, and if the department would then accept the certification from third-party assessors. The department's position is that they will not recognize third-party assessor certifications, and that's because then the department would need to be in the business of certifying the third-party assessors. Um, as Vicki mentioned, depending on the size and complexity of the systems we're talking about, many of these things don't require big um, hardware changes or things that would require that level of expertise. Um, that's not to say that someone might not be able to bring someone in to help them get their system into compliance, but ultimately, like any other clause in a contract, it's the contractor that needs to attest to the fact that they meet the terms of the contract. Um, in an additional question in that line is that there are no penalties or remedies different than how you would deal with any other contract clause. Um, so the way that we have oversight of this requirement is the same type of oversight that you would have um, for any other contract clauses that are in place. Um, so we try to emphasize that fact a lot. We know people are out there um, being asked to you know, take on third party assessors and getting certifications and we know people are actually doing it. Um, but it's important for us to know that that is not what um, is required of industry. What we do have in place um, now um, is a new requirement that came out in the revision to 171, um, I wanna say in the October, summer, summer, 
time frame, sorry. Um, so this is the 110th requirement in 171, and it's a requirement for the contractor to have a system security plan. Um, what the system security plan is, the vehicle they use to document how, what they're doing to protect their information system. So this is a place where they document how they implement the requirements in 171. Um, it does not say that they have to provide this to the government, but the government may ask for the contractor to submit his system security plan. So this is a very good way for program offices and requiring activities who have a high level of risk and really need to know ahead of time the state of a contractor's information system, they can request the system security plan either in the solicitation, it can be part of the source selection process. There's a variety of ways that you can use this plan um, to address the state of their information system. Um, it's also important to know that at any given moment, it's virtually impossible for a contractor to be in 100% compliance with 171 because it's a very um, liquid type of system. Things change. They might have temporary deficiencies, things that they're working towards, things that just haven't gotten in place yet. So along with the system security plan, you would also document plans of action and milestones. Um, and that is also something that the government can ask for um, if they don't have all of the requirements implemented, they can ask for their plan of action. Um, and then it becomes like a risk-based decision for our requiring activities and program offices to decide is that system going to protect their information to the degree that they believe it needs to be protected. Um, so that's a new requirement, but we think it's very important, especially with the December 31st, 2017 deadline approaching for industry. Um, so what this might say is if there is a, um, for a very large company who needs to implement multi-factor authentication across hundreds of thousands of employees, they might need to have a process in place with how that's going to happen. And it might take longer than 2017 to get there. They would document that in their system security plan. Um, what's interesting about this system security plan is that the NIST 800-171 says um, that the system security plan documents how the contractor is implementing 171. And our DFARS rule says that the contractor must implement 171. It doesn't say that they need to be in 100% compliance 100% of the time. Um, so this is a very good addition. I think you will, hear, you will find from industry's perspective um, and from the government's perspective as well. So a few other things in the clause. Um, because as a department, we, we basically had about a two-year period from 2015 when we put out the um, interim rule until it went final. And then having extended the requirements to be compliant until December of 2017, you had almost two years for the industry to work on it. Um, but we were a little bit concerned that perhaps industry might not jump on those 110 security requirements right away, and they might wait until, say, December of 2017 to start that process. So in order to make sure that they were working towards being compliant, we put in a requirement that within 30 days of a contract award, they needed to report to the DOD CIO the uh, requirements they were not yet compliant with. Okay, so um, what we have been able to do is since about February of last year is see the evolution and the growth as industry becomes more and more compliant um, as they start working through all of those requirements and, and starting to put in place solutions that satisfy those requirements. Now, with small business, it's um, a mix. What I've seen is some small businesses are doing extremely well and are almost all fully compliant because it was easier for them to implement some of the solutions than some of the very large companies. And then I have other small businesses who really just aren't there yet and haven't figured it out. So you have a full spectrum, but we have seen across the board a lot of very good progress me being made toward being compliant with um, all of the requirements. So that was the first part of it, is just being able to have a sense of how well industry was doing. Um, the second thing is we recognize that there might be situations where a security requirement would not be applicable for a particular system. 
Um, and the best example I can give to you of that is if you, um, you don't want to have a system timeout if that system is the one that's the heart monitor system and it's keeping somebody alive. So that's one of those things where you don't want to have, you don't want to implement that security requirement on that system. So what we asked the industry to do is to tell us when it's not applicable and explain to us why. And there are lots and lots of those types of things that we're seeing. There's some diagnostic machines on a flight line. Um, there's, a, you know, a manufacturing processes where if you had to, t if the system timed out, it would, it would totally mess up the entire production line. So those are things that we know about and that we just tell industry now, please document that and put it into your system security plan. The other option out there was there was always the potential that for some reason this body of requirements wouldn't work for an industry and we wanted to make sure that if they asked to implement something different than that, that they would get one response for the Department of Defense. Because a company has one information system generally, if you uh, generalize it, one, one network, many, many contracts with many DOD components. And if you went to each contracting officer, I can guarantee you, you would get a different answer from each one about whether that was okay or what you should do differently. So we recognized that when we, when we wrote the clause and made sure that we had a single place to adjudicate all of those. So that is done in, in actually in my office for the CIO. So we don't get too many of those today uh, because 800-171 is easier to work with than the 800-53 requirements we had back in 2013. It's pretty rare for us to get someone's request for um, an alternative. And what we have found is when they do submit it, generally we say that that looks like you're compliant with the requirement. We don't think you need an alternative to be approved. But it has been effective to kind of normalize the responses and to make sure that they get um, consistent responses. So another feature of the clause is cyber incident reporting. If an incident occurs on their network where there's covered defense information, or if there's an incident that occurs that prevents them pr from providing what we've told them is operationally critical support, they're required to report that cyber incident to the department, and at which point we will take certain actions. And it is not a contractual action at that point, it is an internal action within the department to understand the impact of that cyber incident on the DOD's military operations. So if it's operation critical support and they can't provide it, the DOD needs to know that because we're depending upon that in a, in a warfighting situation or whatever contingency that may be happening. If it affects the covered defense information, we find out that uh, all of the um, very sensitive information that had to do with the development of a capability of a weapon system was now exfiltrated by an adversary. We also need to know that, and we need to go back and re assess what we call the damage. And we have a, a slide on that in a moment. But we have to do that to understand the impact to the DOD's mission. So it's very important to us that we see that cyber incident reporting. It's not meant to be punitive. It's not meant to be say, say oh, you were bad. You weren't you weren't compliant with the security requirements. Um, because often, if you were 100% um, compliant with all of the requirements in 171 you could still have an adversary come into your system. So a very motivated adversary is going to come in and is going to take advantage of any type of weakness that you have. So especially if it's something that they want. So they're going to look for that. The second thing is in, in the, we had language in, um, in the National Defense Authorization Act that helped us with this, and we wanted to get malware from the companies. If they're able to isolate it and submit it to us, we want to take a look at it so we could take it apart, do some forensic analysis, and do some really good stuff to figure out who's coming after us, what are the signatures, and what can we share back with our, with our community so we can be better protected moving forward. So this is really important to us. And this is on the damage assessment piece of it. Our point here is that we want to look at the media, we want to look at what happened, and understand the impact to the mission. At that point, that's not so much a contractual decision, it's a decision in part of the department. How do we move forward? How do we mitigate the loss of this data or the compromise of this data that was so important to us that we told them they had to take care of it and safeguard it in the first place? The other um, aspect that we deal with with the um, DFARS role is protecting information in a cloud environment. And there's two different ways that that happens. Um, the first one on this chart is when our safeguarding covered defense information clause applies. And that's because it's when a contractor is using a cloud solution 
um, as part of the um, performance of the contract. So if they are choosing to store some of our covered defense information that we provide to them or that they develop for our effort on a cloud, um, in that case, the 7012 applies. And what it states is that they need to, that cloud needs to um, meet um, equivalent to the FedRAMP moderate baseline. So realizing that contractors aren't able to deal in the same FedRAMP um, scenario that the Department of Defense does, they just need to go to a cloud provider that is meeting that FedRAMP moderate baseline. Um, at the same time, they still need to comply with the other aspects of the DFARS clause, like cyber incident reporting and damage assessment. In cases where um, the department is actually contracting for cloud services um, and when the data is being processed on the DOD's behalf, that would be considered a DOD information system if you think back to that very first chart that we looked at. And in that case, um, the Department of Sen Department of Defense System Requirements Guide, the SRG, um, is what applies. Those are the requirements that that cloud provider needs to have on his system. And the DFARS clause 252-239-7010 is where those requirements for the SRG are based. Um, so it's important to realize that there's two different approaches um, to how we deal with that. Um, so we try to make that pretty clear up front for folks. Start. When we started out in um, the very second slide, I think it was, I said that there was regulatory requirements and we had some voluntary programs. We recognized that industry um, could you benefit from hearing about threat and understanding that the threat is very real and that the threat is coming after them. So one of the ways we've done that is with a public-private partnership that allows industry to collaborate with the Department of Defense. Um, through this um, program, the Defense Cybersecurity Program, we're able to share uh, threat information and actionable cyber indicators for industry and mitigation strategies that helps them better protect our information. We, um, we do have some limitations um, because we do share class classified information with these companies. They are required to be cleared companies. We're currently in the process of looking how do we go beyond the cleared companies because a lot of your small business companies are not going to have the facility clearances and don't have necessarily have the need to have the classified. It tends to be difficult to take um, to have a, a threat discussion without somebody with a clearance, but we're trying to we're working right now to see how we can do that in a way that's more meaningful um, than we currently have. So that's the basic requirement. Um, and then we have a web portal, and our web portal is uh, is is like one just one stop shopping for defense industry. They can report a cyber incident. They can apply to join the, the classified sharing program and log into the portal as well. Um, we're leveraging this portal to share information with industry. It's a public page, but once you log into the portal, um, then you have access uh, to more information. Um, this is just a list of resources. I believe you all will get these slides, so it's just something you can keep. Um, it basically points you to where the different documents can be found. Um, we also will mention that we will be attending the APTAC spring training um, next week. Um, so in doing that, we will have put together a package of information that we will provide to the different PTACs so they can distribute them um, to the folks that come to them for assistance. And we will also like go through a brief that's focused focus um, generally on the um, needs of the small business community. One other aspect that um, often comes up with that community um, is flow down of this clause down through the supply chain. And something that the department has been emphasizing right now is that we really need to deliberately manage the flow down of our um, important and sensitive information. Um, so we have several organizations in the department that actually tracked where their data is and learned that sometimes way down in the supply chain, someone building a screw for something had the whole tech data package and there was really no need for that. So we really, from the government perspective and from prime contractor perspective, need to manage how that data flows down and if you're dealing with a contractor who you don't believe is able to protect the data then your sensitive data should not be going down to them um, I think that's our last 
questions? So I would say we have a place where you could submit questions. Um, this is our organizational mailbox. We get questions from PMs, requiring activities, contracting officers, contractors, you name it. We get everything that you could possibly imagine. We will make our, we, we answer all these, all the questions that come in, and sometimes those questions are translated into our FAQs, and sometimes it's just a one-off discussion, sometimes it's a phone call between a contracting officer, a, a PM, and the contractor themselves. So we are working through all of those things, and we found that to be pretty successful. We have a great team that comes together to answer all these questions. Um, and like I said, the ones that, that bubble up most frequently are, are posted and published on the DPAP website. So this brings us to questions. I understand there are some questions, and we have about 15 minutes left to take any questions that you might have. Hi. Hi. Got a couple of questions. Uh, do you envision that DCMA is going to be including this in their regular pre-award surveys when they go out, or only a special request by a contracting officer? I didn't quite hear you clearly, but okay. I think you were asking about DCMA's role, is that right? In the pre-award survey, yeah. So um, we're working with DCMA right now to look at how they can help us ensure that there is consistent implementation of this rule across industry. So in their um, normal contractor surveillance, they can do things like ensure that the clause is in the um, contract because we're still working that aspect of it. We're up to, I think, like 80% of the time it gets in there, but not always. Um, they can do things like um, afterward, they can look and see if there is a system security plan. They are not, um, they don't have the expertise to be able to evaluate a system security plan, but they certainly can look to see if one exists. Um, they can um, see if there is a process in place to report cyber incidents, um, certain validation, certain, um, what is that called, Vicki? You need certain credentials to be able to report a cyber incident, so the contractor per the clause needs to have those credentials, so DCMA can ask if those things are in place. So we're looking at a list of things that they can do um, during their normal surveillance, um, and they would do that in concert with the DID CIO and with program offices and with damage assessment offices, so they won't be out there on their own doing these things, because we realize that they aren't really staffed to be cybersecurity experts, um, but there are a whole host of things that they can do um, as they're doing their normal surveillance process. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Are you expecting a lot of non-responsibility determinations in the beginning? Um, no, we, we are not, because again, um, the, the onus of determining if that the state of someone's information system um, is if it's a, if it meets the level of risk i mean it's really a risk based decision for the program managers and the requiring activity so um, if it's of that critical importance to a program office that their data is protected and we've worked with some where that is the case, they will ahead of time in the solicitation process say that this is something that they're going to look at and they make sure that they're satisfied with the state of the system before they award. Um, not all cases and not all contracts will deal with information where it's that critical. Um, so it's really on the program management offices to understand when they need to make sure a certain level of protections are in place. Thanks. What about other transactions? It, the non-FAR contracts, the consortiums and that sort of thing. We get a panic call. Small businesses are walking away because of this requirement. So again, um, I'm not versed in every aspect of what kinds of vehicles can be used, but we have been working with folks that deal with tenders or other types of vehicles um, and working with them on how they can get these requirements or what would be the proper requirements in place in those vehicles. And so, um, again, we're just trying to reach out to the folks that have those issues and if you know of any particular ones that you could bring forward to us so we could kind of work through that, that would be great. Will do, thanks. I have a few online questions. 
Can contractors charge the government to implement the security guidelines? So since this is a clause in the contract, um, yes, just like any other clause, the contract's price is going to take that, the contractor's price is going to take that into account. Now, we find in most cases, if a contractor has an, a single enterprise system or, you know, a few large enterprise systems, that would be an indirect cost. Um, in some cases, it might be a direct cost. If they're dealing with an information system that supports this weapon system only and it was created only for this effort, then they would probably charge them directly. Um, but it is a contract clause just like any other contract clause, and you would expect that the government needs to reimburse the contractor for implementing it. Next question. With respect to certifications related to cybersecurity, do you think the government re requiring activities are often setting small businesses up for failure by asking for too many certifications that are hard to get and expensive to obtain, and often are wants rather than needs. So again, we addressed the point already that we're not looking for certifications, um, that we're looking for implementation of the DFARS rule and NIST 171. Again, um, things that come into play here is what, are the, what is the level of risk we're dealing with and how are we managing the flow down of our information. Um, so we, there might be, in dealing with the supply chain, there might be points where what was originally covered, def covered defense information might be disaggre disaggregated to a point where it doesn't need those protections. If you're just building one small piece of the weapon system, um, it may not meet the characteristics that would say that it needs protection. And so those are the things we need to deal with to make sure we're not burdening our smaller companies um, where it's not necessary. Next question. If a contract is violated or breached due to a security fault or failure by the contractor, is this grounds for immediate contract termination? So again, if there is a cyber incident, um, that does not mean there is any fault by the contractor. Somebody implementing 171, 100% all the time, will still have cyber incidents occur. Um, and as Vicki mentioned, the goal of our clause is really to understand what is happening out there and what information is being lost, rather than um, for it to be um, something that is going to go against um, a contractor contractually. Now, if there were cases where they said they were implementing it and it was found that they were not, again, the same penalties and remedies that are in place for other contract clauses is the spectrum of things that could be applied in that case. So there's nothing unique about this rule that says that there are any different penalties or remedies. Next question. Does this new requirement mean that the federal government now has a direct relationship with the supply chain, or does cybersecurity information flow up through the supply chain to the prime as it does today for other requirements? So that's interesting because um, with the clause, there's the flow down requirement. So you would flow it onto your subcontractor. So the relationship between the prime and the subcontractor is still exists, obviously. Um, for this particular clause, if a cyber incident occurs, then that subcontractor or sub 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 subcontractor is supposed to report directly to the Department of Defense. Um, so we're not telling them to report up through the chain of, of, of subcontractors. Uh, the one thing that we do tell them in the clause is we require them to notify the prime um, or to whom that they have who they have the subcontract with. Um, and, and to give that, that prime the incident number that was reported to the department so that conversation can happen if, if, they, if they need to. Now, in this case, um, the primes are really very well aware of the requirement for reporting, and they're concerned because if it's their program and it's their subcontract, then, of course, they, ha they care about that, too. So I suspect that they are starting to have those conversations with their subcontractors about when you do have a cyber incident or if you have a cyber incident, this is what I want to know, and then they're going to be part of that agreement. So um, in, in some places, it'll be a direct relationship 
for it in the cybersecurity case with the reporting and also the submission of the media, but all other things will be normal. Yeah, and so what remains true is that the prime contractor is still responsible um, for his subcontractors and supply chain. And so that's why we emphasize when we speak with our prime contractors that they really do need to pay attention to how they flow that information down because they are responsible for its protection throughout the supply chain. Are there any additional audience questions? Okay, I have another question. With all of the new requirements, how would you encourage or direct new companies in terms of cybersecurity? So the first thing I would do is sit down and read through what the requirements are. Um, we find a lot of times that people either haven't read the clause or they didn't read the requirements and they certainly didn't read the FAQs which answered a lot of those questions. So the first place I would do is sit down, read through the requirements. I would assess where I'm at, and I would make sure I have a plan to move ahead. And I think that's a very rational and reasonable approach for all industry, whether they're large or small, is until you actually read through it and understand where, you're, where you may have um, gaps, you don't know how to move forward. Um, if there are, there are a lot of guidelines, there's a lot of things, uh, just there's so much information today about cybersecurity. You can look at the NIST voluntary framework that helps you build your whole cybersecurity plan. That isn't required in this case, but it is something to be familiar with. You need to have a plan. You need to think through what happens when there's a cyber incident. How am I going to react? Not only for how, what I'm having to report to the department, but what I'm going to do to take care of my own business and how I'm going to manage the 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 press and the public opinion and all the things that go with a major cyber incident. You need to think through those things. And the, the more you can get ahead of that and have thought through those processes, the better off you'll be when that incident does in fact occur. But where I would start was sit down and read through the requirements and just assess where you're at and then figure out how you want to move forward. One of the stories that Vicki and I often repeat is we were at an audience of small business owners um, about six months ago, and a girl stood was sat on a panel with us who was a small business owner, and she told us that um, she decided to pull in her network guy, who was her nephew, one Saturday, bought him a box of donuts, and they actually read through the 171 and then determined where they were in terms of implementation, and she found it to be quite beneficial and we always love that story after she actually told us that instead of donuts it was really bacon that she bought him we have time for one more question are there any p tags that specialize in cybersecurity that is something I do not know um, but I think I can probably learn next Monday and Tuesday when I'm at their <laughs> annual training week. So we'll check that out. There's a question here. Uh, yeah. uh, very, easy, uh, very easy question. Can you just give me the uh, website again where somebody goes to report cybersecurity incidents? I think it's right at the bottom of this slide. That's, you know, oh, wait, oh, no, sorry. It is, it is there. Sorry. It's dibnet.dod.mil. It's right here at the bottom, dibnet.dod.mil, and it's HTTPS. Yeah, that's the website. And then if you want to submit questions to an email address, we can give you that one too. Just a note, to record it or a cyber incident, you must have a DOD-approved medium assurance certificate. So whether it's an ident trust or any of the other ECA certificates, those are fine. Um, but they do need to have that so we can authenticate who is coming into our system. It is a requirement and it is also mentioned in the clause. And the questions email is at the bottom. The Virginia PTAP at Mason Enterprise Center, George Mason University, specializes in cybersecurity training. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for allowing us to come today. Uh, we really are trying to do a lot of outreach to small businesses and to make sure that our community is informed, and so we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today.